support that the uh, European Command uh, continues to give to uh, many thousands of uh, Afghan evacuees. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to the general. He'll have some opening comments. And then, just like before, I'll moderate the Q&A. Uh, please, when I call on you, uh, identify yourself and your outlet. Uh, and if you could limit your follow-ups to a minimum, that would allow more people to get questions in. Uh, and we'll, uh, after the, we're done with the general, I'll stay behind if there's any additional questions that we need to answer today. With that, general, sir, over to you. Okay. You get caller now. Yeah. We'll get this fixed. Send him a, we should send him a message saying it can't be heard. I think called the general. General, I can't can't hear you, sir. this out. General, can you hear me yet? I do not have Yes, thanks. Hey, John, I've got you loud and clear. How do you read? I got you now, sir. Thank you so much for hanging with us. I hate to ask you if you could start on over again. Yeah, you, you, you bet, John. And, and good afternoon to you. And, and again, if you didn't catch it, welcome to all the members of the Pentagon Press Corps. On behalf of all the members of USUCOM, I want to extend our deepest sympathy to the families of the 13 heroes who gave their lives to save so many Americans and so many Afghans. Uh, we also extend our thoughts and prayers to all those wounded and to all the family members who were involved and still remain attached to those who paid the ultimate price in Afghanistan over the course of the last two decades. Uh, you'll always be remembered and you'll always be in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, let me begin by offering a professional thanks to the militaries and the governments of Germany, Italy, and Spain. Uh, that Their comprehensive efforts over the course of the last several weeks has allowed us to facilitate great operations and achieve a high degree of success. And we deeply appreciate what they've done from the governmental level all the way down to the military level. Uh, let me slow down for a second and also take this opportunity to thank a group of people that we don't often talk about, and that's the volunteers. Uh, it's an interesting story here in Europe. Uh, the operation first commenced on Friday, the 20th of August, and our wing commander at Ramstein noted that we had a lot of volunteers on that day doing a lot of great work, and we actually had 20 or 30 volunteers, and we were all very, very pleased to note that we had 30 volunteers. Well, several days later, the 30 volunteers grew to hundreds of volunteers. And today, as we scan across Europe, we have thousands of volunteers who are doing everything uh, from helping with food items, helping with clothing, serving as counselors, helping to organize, serving to, and assisting with security. Uh, they are tremendous force multipliers for us, and they are helping to facilitate good order and discipline in the environment day in and day out. Since Friday, the 20th of August, when the operation started, we at UCOM have processed 155 inbound flights and we've taken care of 38,000 Afghan evacuees. On the ground at this very moment, we have 12,000 Afghan evacuees at Ramstein Air Base in Germany, 5,000 evacuees at Rhein Ordnance Barracks in Germany, 2,500 evacuees at Naval Air Station Sigonella in Italy, and 1,800 Afghan evacuees at Nav Station Rota in Spain. 
since Friday, the 20th of August, when the operation started, uh, we've been able to process and have 16,000 Afghan evacuees depart from Europe to the continental United States. 14,500 of those came from Ramstein Air Base, 1,500 came from Siganella, and approximately 500 came from Rota Air Base in Spain. And the reason that I mentioned this evacuation is because it's intense and we anticipate more intensity in the future and the mission must go on. Aside from the evacuee operation that we're currently working in Yukon, we bear the responsibility to provide secure sovereignty for our European nations as well as to support NATO. We've been able to continue all of those operations via our operations activities and investments and today the region remains secure and conditions are normal on the ground. The entire time we bear the responsibility to ensure that we continue to promote the safety and security for all involved, whether it's the evacuees, our fellow volunteers across Europe, or all of the great warriors that serve us in US Yukon. John, I'll wrap up with a final thanks to some critical mission partners. First, the United States Interagency all of our European allies and partners, U.S. Transportation Command, U.S. Northern Command, and U.S. Central Command. Uh, th their support to U.S. European Command has been remarkable. Uh, today, we're excited about the fact because all those agencies work together to facilitate the flow of travelers and Afghans from Europe to freedom. John, I'll stop right there, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you, General. Appreciate that. We're going to start with uh, Lita Baldor from AP. Lita, I think you're on the phones, yeah? Yes, thanks, John. Uh, thank you, General. Uh, I have a question um, about the screening of evacuees as they come in, and I know realize the military isn't doing a lot of that, but can you give us a, a better picture of um, what is happening to people who may be failing uh, the screening or problems with screening are the countries, uh, the, the allies that you're dealing with, are they expressing some concerns about what is going to happen to those people? Where, what will the U.S. do with them? And can you tell us also um, if there has been any uh, COVID problems with, with those uh, evacuees as, as they are being processed? Thank you. Uh, Lita, I'll, I'll kind of go reverse order. Uh, number one, we're, we're pleasantly surprised at the very, very few COVID situations that we've had abroad in Europe. Uh, our, our policy is to allow the field commanders in place uh, to govern the administration of COVID testing and COVID vaccination based off conditions on the ground. And as you well know at this time, uh, the game plan is for all of our evacuees and travelers to ultimately get to the United States, get to military installations, and, and then at that point they would receive the appropriate testing and the appropriate vaccinations. Uh, with, with respect to allied concerns on folks that we are screening. Uh, so far, we've had tremendous cooperation in this area. We, we've informed the nations of Germany, Italy, and Spain when we have individuals who are coming up close to the 10-day time limit, and we've received 100% cooperation from the nations in this area. And Lito, with respect to screening, it's come a long ways in the last 10 days. Uh, what, what we do is in process our evacuees. And during the course of the in-processing, we conduct combined biometric and biographic screening so that through DOD channels, through CBP channels, and through FBI channels, we, we have compliment, comprehensively scrutinized th their background. A and this process takes place at, at the initial screening when the evacuees come to our intermediate basis. And we wanna make sure that we conduct the screening get the results and ensure that we've got results on the individual before we put these individuals into their sleeping quarters. And then as they remain on station, at some point, they'll be notified that it's time to depart. And as the individuals depart, they'll be screened one more time to make sure that from a biometric and biographical standpoint, cleared through DOD, CBP and FBI, uh, that they continue to remain in the green. Uh, I, I will tell you, we've also been pleasantly surprised with a number of individuals that are in need of further processing slash more screening. And the way the process works at Ramstein, the way it works at Siganella, and the way it currently works at Rota is during that initial in-screening process, 
if an individual pops red, uh, we calmly take them out of the normal processing line and we put them in a different location so that we can have some isolation and have a little bit of extra time to make sure that everybody is as safe and secure as possible. Lita, that, that's a, a big and over a little map description. Uh, it's a lot more complicated than that. Uh, we've refined this process over the course of the last 10 days. As you can well imagine, if we wind up in situations to where we, were, we are backed up uh, with evacuees at certain locations, if the screening process is too exorbitant and too slow, uh, we can wind up having some serious problems. When we initially started operations here in Europe, our, our average wait time in the in-processing line uh, put us in a position to where we could in-process about 60 folks per hour. Uh, today, we possess the capability to process 250 folks per hour, and that has a lot to do with the improvement in, in the software with respect to our biometric machines communicating with our biographical machines. Lita, I hope this helps. A, a quick follow-up so I understand. Um, uh, when you say 50, 250 folks per hour and 60 per hour, is that because you have more locations or are you talking about in a in, at one particular location? And, and, and that's all I have. Thanks. Uh, that, that, that's that's a, an average of the three current locations that we're working with here in Europe at Ramstein in Germany, at Rota Nav Station in Spain, and at Siganella in Italy. Hey, General Walters, it's Courtney QB from NBC News. I have a, just a couple follow ups on all of that. So, what happens uh, the, when the individual pops red, as you said? And it's sent for further screening. Have you had any who have not been ultimately cleared? And are and and what happens in that case? And then I just want to be clear: when you're talking about the 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 COVID situations, you're not actually doing any testing for COVID of the evacuees, mm -hmm. correct? They don't get tested until, until they come to the U.S. And or if or if you are, can you tell us how, how that's happening? Is it is it only people who present symptoms or self-identify as having symptoms? Courtney, the, the, the process is, as you just described, ultimately the plan is to test these individuals once they get to CONUS to their final uh, military installation. But uh, due to situations on the ground, and if we have situations where we, we see symptoms and, and the commander on site needs to have that person tested, uh, we, we reserve the right to allow that commander to do so, so that he can preserve the health and well-being of the entire population in their community. Uh, they, they've got small resources to be able to do that. It, it, it hasn't been executed often. Uh, I, I can tell you in the last three days, it, it hasn't been executed once. Uh, so so, so that, that takes care of the COVID side of the house. And, and Courtney, you, you, you talked a little bit about screening. C can you kind of clarify for me exactly what it is you're looking at? Sure. So when, the, when an individual pops red, you said they're isolated for further testing or further screening, I guess. Have you had anyone who's not ultimately been cleared and brought back into the regular population? Or in other words, are you holding any, any individuals for, because they've popped red and not been cleared? Uh, Courtney, at this time, it's a, it, it's a rolling number. I've got 58 individuals that are in need of further processing and based on when they entered the queue, I anticipate that, that all 58 will probably clear. Uh, I, I will tell you that we've had one individual uh, since the operation started in Europe on the 20th of September who actually popped red and that individual is currently in the appropriate custody of, of US interagency officials. And, and Germany has been very, very cooperative, and we are still uh, working his background investigation. Okay, Jen. General Walters, Jennifer Griffin with Fox News. Can you give us any more details about that individual and what uh, kind of security threat he posed? Was he a member of ISIS-K, Taliban? And just so I understand what you told Courtney, there's no COVID testing being done of these individuals before they get to uh, CONUS. Why? Uh, first, Jennifer, the, the, the individual that's currently in custody is, is, is not a, a, of a high threat as, as far as I know. The, the rest of that information is protected, it, it, and, and that's, that's with our, our agencies here that, 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 that are representative of that individual. 
uh, with, with respect to testing uh, based off the requirement and the timelines of, of the nations uh, allowing us to use their soil for 10 days, it, it can become an administrative challenge with, with respect to moving people. A as I said, Jennifer, commanders on the ground uh, have the right to conduct testing and administer vaccination if conditions on the ground warrant. And, and that's a commander's call uh, that, that they're equipped to make and, and they've got the resources to be able to support that. But for the purpose of facilitating the flow of our evacuees to their final destination in CONUS in order to comply with the restrictions of the nations. This is the current policy that we have in place. Go to the phone lines. Uh, Jeff uh, Shogel. Uh, thank you, General. You had mentioned that you expected the mission to grow more intense. Can you elaborate on that? I, I can, Jeff. Uh, we're we're at a point right now where we're we're processing in about the same number that we're processing out, and it's 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 not comfortable uh, for our troopers in the field. It, it's challenging. Uh, th th there is the potential uh, that that we would be in a position in Europe as a result of our existing capacity to continue to facilitate the flow. Uh, of evacuees out of the Middle East to ultimately get to the United States. Uh, so in order to make sure that our troops are as ready as they can possibly be, we are hoping for the best, but preparing for the worst. And so that intensity level has to remain very, very high with respect to our readiness to be prepared to process folks. I, I think what I've seen in the last six hours tells me that we're about to become uh, in a position to where we're going to process about five or 600 in every day, and we're probably going to have 2,500 to 3,000 to depart every day. And if that continues in perpetuity for the remaining time, we'll be in good shape. But the next 24 hours will be very, very telling. And I want to make sure that our troopers are prepared for the most intense situations possible. Jeff, that's why the, the, the narrative surrounds that, that conversation. Thank you. And are any of the Afghan refugees being housed at Camp Bonsteel in Kosovo? Uh, none of our U.S. Afghan evacuees are at Camp Bonsteel. We are just on the edge with respect to NATO capability uh, to putting some NATO Afghan evacuees into Camp Bechtel, which is very close to Camp Bonsteel, but we haven't started that yet. Sylvie. Uh, <clears throat> Hello, General Sylvie Lantom from AFP. Um, the Europeans um, were a bit uh, uh, frustrated by the way uh, the evacuation went in Kabul. Uh, they were not uh, able to evacuate as many as their citizens as they wanted. And today there was a, a meeting, a defense minister, a meeting of the defense ministers of the European Union. And they talked about creating a rapid European rapid uh, reaction force. Do you think, as Sakur, do you think it would be a good idea? Uh, well, well, first, I, I can't speak for the European Union. Uh, I, I certainly could speak as Sakur for NATO. Uh, I, I've, I've, I've had reports from many nations, and, and the reports that have come to me through military channels and, and Minister of Defense channels have all actually been in the positive. And, and I would tell you that, that NATO and the EU are always attempting to do all that they can to make sure that we can facilitate peace on our soil. And I can't speak for the efforts that you're quoting with respect to the European Union, but, but, but I would say anything that we can do to promote peace and security on the European continent is a plus. Megan. Hi, General Walter. It's Megan Myers from Military Times. You mentioned that the European countries have given you a 10-day deadline to get these evacuees moved through. So which screenings or processes are they doing in Europe, um, and what do they have to finish up when they get to the U.S.? Is it more screening, or is it just resettlement? Um, what processes need to be finished? Uh, Megan, our, our evacuees receive biometric and biographical screening. Uh, they actually get screened twice. Uh, once when they come in to our, to our intermediate staging basis, 
uh, once they've been initially screened, th then they're put in their sleeping quarters. And, and once it's time to depart, they're screened one more time to make sure that we've, we've cleared as many wickets as possible. And once they get to the United States, I believe they go through a similar process with the same machines to make sure that they continue to clear DOD, CBP, and FBI. Health screenings or anything like that that's going on in Europe, that final step in the process is still going on stateside. Uh, the, 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 a thorough health screening will occur stateside, but, but we're in a position with, with our medical resources uh, to, to get a, a broad brush scan from a medical perspective and to take temperatures and to make sure that we're treating folks that, that need immediate medical help. And, and in, in many cases, it happens to be expected mothers. Tara. Hi, General. Uh, Tara Kopp with Defense One. You talked about uh, in-processing everyone. We learned yesterday that many of the SIV applicants that had tried to get out of Afghanistan didn't get through. So could you give us a picture of who actually did get through? If they weren't SIVs, uh, who are they? Are they P1s, P2s? Are they Afghans? Could you talk a little bit about what you've seen in the processing? Sir, I, I will tell you that uh, I, I don't have the facts that you're quoting with respect to the statistics uh, b between what came out of HKIA to the Middle East and here. I, I can tell you that uh, of the number of folks that I told you that we process, uh, we, we're in a position to where we, we have 792 AMSITs, uh, we have 996 legal permanent residents. Uh, but, but aside from those qualifiers with respect to the individuals, uh, th that information is probably uh, uh, kept in, in DOS channels, and you probably need to direct your question to, to that agency. Okay, back to the phones. Jared? Hi, sir. My question's been answered. Thank you. Hey, J Jared, you're breaking up. Can you try it again? Yes, sir. My question has been answered. Thank you. I didn't get that. Go ahead. Uh, yes, so Brian Everstein with Aviation Week. You had mentioned at the top you had 155 inbound flights. How many outbound flights have you had? And with the Kabul airlift ending, are you getting more gray tail capacity into your AOR to help with the outbound? If so, do you anticipate needing craft assets for an extended period of time? Uh, Brian, right now we, we don't have a need for Civil Reserve Air Fleet participation just because we're, we're probably reaching a point where it's not required. Uh, we've had 155 inbound flights, and I don't have the precise number of outbound flights, but I would suspect that it's fairly close to that. So it, it, as long as the flow continues as expected, for the next 12 hours, we're bracing for high intensity. But after that, we should be in a position from a great tail perspective to where the United States Air Force on the C-17 side of the house can adequately support the flow into Europe and the flow out of Europe. Okay, time for one more, and then uh, we'll let the general uh, wrap it up. Go ahead, Tony. Hey, so Tony Capasio with Bloomberg News. On the biometric screening, can you give a sense of what databases are being tapped when someone gets a biometric screen? And will that information translate over to the United States mm -hmm. or their eventual residents to help them get uh, identification when they land here or their home uh, or where they end up? Hey, Tony, the, the biometric side of the screening, I believe, taps the DOD base and the biographic side of the screening that gets into fingerprinting and the retinal scan gets into CBP and FBI. I, I can tell you on my limited computer experience that, that those databases have the capability to talk to one another. So you can flip cross court from DOD to CBP and FBI, and we can take this electronic database and flip it to CONUS. So with, with respect to the question that you asked, my simple answer is uh, there is compatibility uh, in those systems to the agencies that I just identified. And there is compatibility with those capabilities from the European continent to the continental United States. Thanks. General, I'm gonna thank you so much for your time. I apologize for the technical difficulties early, but I'd like to turn it back over to you for any closing comments you might have, sir. Well, uh, uh, John, first, th thanks to you for, for doing what you are doing. And I, I just wanted to foot stomp one more time the, the, the tremendous patriotism that we see from our volunteers, their, their DOD dependents, uh, that they are local nationals uh, from, from Germany, from Spain, and from Italy. 
and and they're excited when they see these Afghans and when they look in their eyes uh, that they see folks with with hope and inspiration and that actually gives them inspiration and I I want to thank uh, our nation for doing what it's doing in treating all of all of these Afghan evacuees with dignity and respect Thank you much general appreciate your time this afternoon and this evening Okay, uh, I got a, a few things uh, to to uh, go through with you, and then uh, and then we can take some additional questions. Uh, in the wake of Hurricane Ida, the department is working closely with FEMA and local, state, and federal partners in supporting the states and areas impacted. Currently, there are roughly 5,800 National Guard soldiers and airmen from Louisiana and 10 other states uh, responding to the aftermath of the hurricane in Louisiana. Uh, in Pennsylvania, roughly 140 Guard personnel have been activated along with high water vehicles and helicopters to support areas that are affected by the flooding. As of this morning, more than 650 active duty personnel are supporting hurricane response operations in and around Louisiana. Uh, the mission sets include route clearance, debris removal, high water rescue and transport. The uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, has deployed survey boats in southeast Louisiana in coordination with the Coast Guard to help open navigation lanes in the region. And the Corps is also providing technical engineering assistance to state and local authorities for flood response and risk management. Now, in Haiti, the Department continues supporting USAID, working with international partners and allies to provide life-saving aid and assistance to the people of Haiti in response to the recent earthquake there. U.S. Southern Command and Joint Task Force Haiti have been working around the clock to help save lives, deliver aid, all since this 14th of August when the 7.2 magnitude earthquake struck. As of early this morning, the Joint Task Force team has conducted more than 660 missions, delivered more than 573,000 pounds of aid, and saved or assisted more than 477 people. We'll continue working uh, with this humanitarian operation until uh, USAID, working with Haitian officials, determines that the department's unique airlift, maritime, transport, and logistic capabilities are no longer necessary, as commercial op op options to transport supplies by air, land, and sea increase on their own. Search and rescue uh, uh, under... Uh, new topic, uh, the Navy and the, and the helicopter crash that they had yesterday. Search and rescue efforts continue for the five missing crew members of the MH-60S helicopter that crashed into the sea yesterday while conducting flight operations from the USS Abraham Lincoln. The aircraft from Helicopter Sea Combat Squadron 8 was operating on deck before the incident. The sailor who was rescued from the aircraft was transported ashore and is in stable condition. The five additional sailors aboard Abraham Lincoln who suffered injuries are also in stable condition. Two of the five Abraham Lincoln sailors were transported ashore for treatment, while three of the five Abraham Lincoln sailors had minimal injuries and remain aboard the ship. An investigation, of course, into the cause of this in, um, incident is underway. Uh, now, on to uh, the boards. Um, uh, you know, back in January of this year, the Secretary directed a zero-based review of all DOD advisory committees to include any committees not subject to the Federal Advisory Committee Act to ensure that committee efforts are focused on our most pressing strategic priorities and our national defense strategy. The Zero Base Review Board has completed its work and they presented their recommendations to the Secretary and the Department is now poised for many of the advisory committees to resume their essential work. The Department's boards and committees have been and will continue to be a valuable resource as we defend the nation, succeed through teamwork, and take care of our people. The Secretary looks forward to working with many of these bodies personally and expects other de Department officials to do the same. After careful consideration of the recommendations resulting from the Zero Base Review, the Secretary has approved the following advisory committees for the resumption of operations. Recommendations for other boards are still under consideration, and we will announce the results of more advisory committees in coming weeks. But the ones that are approved now to resume their work are the Defense Business Board, the Defense Policy Board, the Defense Health Board, the DOD Board of Actuaries, the Medicare Eligible Board of Advisors, <whistles> Defense Science Board, Defense Advisory Committee on Investigation, Prosecution, and Defense of Sexual Assault in the Armed Forces, the Uniform Formulatory Formulary Beneficiary Advisory Panel, Inland Waterways Users Board, 
DOD Wage Committee, Board on Coastal Engineering Research, Marine Corps University Board of Visitors, the Department of Air Force Scientific Advisory Board, U.S. Strategic Command Strategic Advisory Group, the Army Science Board, and finally, the Defense Advisory Committee on Women in the Services. Uh, well, as these boards uh, get populated, we will be, again, transparent with you uh, as, uh, as, as members are uh, brought back into the, the board work. September is Suicide Prevention Month. The health, safety, and well-being of our military community is essential to the readiness of the total force. The department is committed to preventing suicide among service members, veterans, and their families. And we want to remind everyone that support is within reach and emphasize the valuable resources that are available year-round, such as Military One Source and the Veterans and Military Crisis Line. Uh, this year, the DOD Suicide Prevention Month theme is Connect to Protect. Support is within reach. This highlights the vital role that connections to family, friends, and community and resources can play in preventing suicide. Our connections to family, friends, community, and organizations across the department are more important than ever. And as you've heard the Secretary say, mental health is health, period. And that's the way he wants everybody to look at it here. Uh, lastly, on a schedule note, tomorrow the Secretary looks forward to hosting the Italian Minister of Defense here at the Pentagon. A readout of that meeting will be posted, of course, tomorrow afternoon. And with that, we'll start taking questions. Uh, Lita, did you have one for me? Uh, John, no, I'll, I'll pass and let someone who didn't get a question earlier go. Tara. Um, John, you mentioned that the MH60 was operating on deck. So are we to understand that there was a collision or mishap on deck and the helicopter fell off the side? Uh, I don't know what caused the helicopter to go into the water, but our understanding is that, that uh, it was on deck uh, when, when the casualty occurred, whatever that is, and I don't know, the Navy's going to investigate that, but it was on deck and fell from the deck into the water. Okay. And then, um, secondly, yesterday when we had the secretary and the chairman up here, they both mentioned the internal pain that they've felt associated with this. Um, is there going to be additional outreach from the department to veterans, to active duty service members who served in Afghanistan? Because this seems to be somewhat of a trigger for people who are maybe having suicidal ideation or have uh, been depressed, you know, just because of the way it all fell out. One of the reasons I wanted to make sure in my opening statements to, to talk about Suicide Prevention Month in September, of course, obviously, um, uh, but we want to make clear that there are resource, resources available. Uh, and I think you'll hear more from department leadership uh, communicating that across the force. And I know that, I don't want to speak for the VA, but I know that Secretary McDonough feels very strongly about this as well. Um, we all recognize that, that the uh, events in just the recent past, certainly the, the last month or so, uh, will, uh, will factor in and, and, and potentially bear heavily on some of our veterans, Afghan, Afghan war vets. And as you heard the Secretary say yesterday, I mean, everyone's different. Um, and we need to respect the fact that everyone will process this in their own way and over a course of time of their choosing. Uh, but it's important, and I, again, I tried to hit this at the top, that, uh, that however you end up processing this, that you know it's okay to reach out for help, whether that's professional help or just friends, family, colleagues, that, um, that it's important that we respect each other and, uh, and try to stay in touch with one another going forward. But I do think you'll continue to hear throughout this month uh, additional uh, messages from department leadership uh, about that issue, but also just writ large how that ties into mental health in, in particular. Yes, sir. Thanks, John. Travis Tritton with Military.com. I had a COVID question. Um, the House is considering some legislation right now that would prohibit dishonorable discharge for any troop who declines a COVID vaccine. I'm not going to ask you to comment on the legislation, but I, I want to ask you about the punishment. Is dishonorable discharge going to be the outcome for troops? who refused the vaccine? Yeah, Travis, as we've talked about before, the secretary expects that the department leadership will implement this, these mandatory vaccines with skill, but also because we know how to do this uh, across a range of other vaccines, but also professionalism and compassion. And uh, when an individual declines uh, to take 
uh, a mandatory vaccine, they will be given an opportunity to talk to both medical providers as well as their own chain of command so that they can fully understand uh, uh, the decision that, that they are, are making. And the other thing I'd say is that our commanders have a range of tools available to them short of using the Uniform Code of Military Justice uh, to, to, again, uh, try to get uh, men and women in the, in, in, uh, in the department uh, to make the right decision here. So if those other tools do fall, fail, though, and it does go to UCMJ, can you speak at all what the outcome is? Are, are there a range of potential outcomes, or are we looking at a dishonorable discharge? Uh, there are. I mean, if, if it goes, and if it, if it goes to a, a disciplinary procedure, there are, again, a range of options available to commanders, you know, short of, of uh, charges being filed and, and, uh, and, and punishment of, uh, uh, of any given kind. Um, and th this would be something that commanders would handle uh, themselves, Travis. It's not something that wouldn't be some top-down driven uh, uh, set policy for every case across uh, the whole department. This would be something that commanders would uh, be able to decide for themselves. But I want to stress, uh, I don't think it's helpful to get into hypotheticals right now when we're still just at the beginning of this. Uh, but I also want to stress that the Secretary's expectation uh, is that commanders will lead with compassion here uh, and will try to make available to members who are uh, who are not are not willing to abide by the mandatory vaccine to, to make sure that they understand that, that the ramifications of their decision uh, and that they have as much additional exposure to information and context as possible as they as they move forward. Jen. John, has anybody from the Pentagon or CENTCOM had any contact with the Taliban in the last since the last troops have left to begin making arrangements to either uh, coordinate or work together? None that I'm aware of, Jen. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Thank you, John. About the Taliban and Panjshir group, Panjshir group is still resistant, and it looks like they start another several war. Is Pentagon able to direct support the Panjshir group or either Taliban? because people are very worried about the civil war. And the next question, 10 civilian people have been killed by the U.S. Uh, operation or military operation. Any more information or update to investigation, start an investigation about it? The U.S. military mission in Afghanistan is over. Uh, and as for your second question, uh, I would refer you to CENTCOM. I know that Central Command continues to assess uh, the results of that airstrike, and I wouldn't get ahead of, uh, of, of their assessment of it. I would only say two things, and I said it before, no other military works harder than we do to prevent civilian casualties. We certainly never want to see innocent life taken as a result of U.S. Uh, military operations. Uh, and uh, as you heard the chairman say, I think very clearly yesterday, that uh, this strike was uh, based on good intelligence, and we still believe that it prevented an imminent threat to the airport and to our, uh, our men and women that were still serving at the airport. Can I ask a follow-up on that? Yeah, sure. So you're saying that, that the military mission's over, that means that the U.S. is not going to support the Northern Alliance, this resistance group, with any kind of airstrikes against this Taliban fight? The U.S. military mission in Afghanistan is over. Wait, wait, wait. But so, just to be clear, because you will still take strikes against ISIS and al-Qaeda and the CT, Right? So, I mean, from that perspective, there is a military mission in Afghanistan. Yeah, uh, Courtney, what we will do is continue to be able to conduct over the horizon counterterrorism strikes as needed for threats to our interests and to the homeland. And we're absolutely going to do that. But that's a different thing than saying that we have a military, an enduring military mission in Afghanistan. So there will not, there is not, not going to be any effort to, to support the any kind of We will continue against. to defend our interests against ter ter legitimate terrorist threats uh, anywhere in the world. And you heard the secretary say that there's not a, a scrap of earth that we can't hit. Megan. So the Navy and Marine Corps have uh, released their COVID-19 vaccine plans, and they give a 90-day deadline to get vaccinated. It's my understanding that the Army and Air Force plans do not include a deadline. Is that up to the secretary's expectations for a rollout plan? Uh, I'm not going to speak for the Army and the Air Force. I have seen the the Navy's uh, directives. Uh, my understanding is that the Army and the Air Force will be um, uh, will be setting forth their their timing uh, or their 
implementation guidelines here very, very soon. The Secretary wants, as I said before, uh, wants the services to move out as smartly on this as possible um, and to be as efficient and effective in uh, implementing the mandatory vaccines as they can be. And he has made it clear that they need to report re directly back to the Deputy Secretary on a regular basis. But if there's no deadline in there, how is that a mandate? And is that what the Secretary's expectations were for these policies? The Secretary expects that the services will implement the mandatory vaccine with skill and compassion, as I said, and will do it as swiftly and efficiently as their individual um, uh, health care systems and, and capabilities uh, allow. Yeah, go on. Uh, John, you said, Secretary said, and President also said that when U.S. military was in Afghanistan, they gave their best, best training and weapons to the so-called Afghan military force, but they didn't fight. My question is, do you think anybody in the DOD or somewhere feels like, because according to many reports, that they were, our, they were really Taliban's, not the Afghan military? That's why they didn't fight. And second, according to the reports, uh, Pakistan was helping, and they sent 10 to 15,000 Taliban from Pakistan into Afghanistan to fight and support the uh, Taliban. So finally, any message from the secretary to the millions of Afghans who said they are very thankful to the U.S. military that they had protected them for over 20 years, and what is their future? Let me try to take them one at a time, if I remember them correctly. You're asking, do we believe that a large portion of the Afghan forces collapsed because they were Taliban? I've not seen any indication that that's the, the case. Um, your second question was about Pakistan flowing in fighters. I've not seen uh, anything to corroborate that report. I would, re as we said before, uh, Pakistan has a shared interest in uh, the hay safe havens that exist along that border, and they too have become uh, and have been victims of of uh, terrorist activity. And uh, I mean, I think that's something that that uh, that we all share in common here is um, is helping helping each other not become victim uh, to that to those kinds of attacks from that part of the world. And your third question was the message to Afghans um, after 20 years. Uh, I look. You know, you said, I think the question you said was that, that we protected them for 20 years. And certainly there's, there's truth in that statement, Goyle. I mean, we were on the ground there for 20 years with uh, NATO and coalition partners, and, um, and, and we did uh, spend blood and treasure uh, uh, to try to make sure Afghanistan doesn't become a safe haven again. Um, and in the process of that, uh, helped build Afghan force capability and competency in the field. Uh, obviously, nobody could have expected that uh, uh, that they that they would not fight um, uh, the, the the way that they didn't fight. But Afghan soldiers too fought and died for their country over the last 20 years. Um, so there was it wasn't just about us protecting Afghan life. There are many many Afghan. Uh, soldiers and many Afghan civilians also suffered over the last 20 years trying to trying to make that country a, a better place, um, and we recognize that. I think you heard the secretary and the chairman both say that yesterday. Secretary's message: Who said that he fought himself this war? Any message from him? I think I'm going to leave it to what the secretary said yesterday. I don't believe that I can improve upon his words at the end of uh, his comments yesterday. Therese. Yes, thank you, John. Um, this goes back to the question earlier about veterans. Um, you know, as someone who has served and served and had the honor to serve with Afghans, we're taught from basic training on up, the number one thing we're taught is you do not leave your man behind. Now, how can the Department of Defense go before the American people, those military service members and those veterans, and say that the mission was accomplished when people were left behind? I think, Trace, that we've been very clear that, that uh, we don't believe the effort has concluded. The military mission of evacuation is over. And as you heard the secretary and the chairman say, so too is the, uh, the, the U.S. war in Afghanistan. 
But you've also heard the Secretary of State say that we're still going. We, we know there are people that didn't make it out, American citizens as well as special immigrant visa applicants. And we are — and the U.S. government is going to continue to look for ways to try to help them find safe passage out of the country. Uh, I don't foresee a military role in that. But I would also remind — and, again, let me make it very clear. Uh, as General McKenzie, I think, said very well, we're all heartbroken that we weren't able to get every single person out. Um, we all recognize that. And don't think for a minute that people don't feel it here, because we do. But it is also important to remember the extraordinary effort that was expended over the course of some 17 days to get over 124,000 people out, including 6,000 American citizens, the vast, vast majority of those we believe that were there. Uh, so, uh, again, while recognizing that are still individuals uh, that will want to get out and will need to get out and will still work on that, I don't want it lost, uh, the extraordinary effort that was — that cost additional bloodshed of American troops. Uh, I don't want that lost, either, that uh, that, that effort was, was done uh, with exceptional professionalism and skill. Think about the airlift effort alone. Uh, over the course of 17 days, no mechanical breakdowns. I mean, it, it was an incredible effort, and uh, I just don't want that to be to be lost in in what is fair scrutiny uh, and fair criticism that not everybody was able to get airlifted out. Uh, an awful lot of people were. Tony. A question on the after action reports uh, that uh, the secretary yesterday said would be done with humility and transparency, and General Milley kept alluding to. It has a, uh, a process been started yet to do formal a formal after-action report? And what will be the topics? Will it be the — how — I'll include the broad topics and the evacuation? Yeah, Tony, I'm not aware of a formal process here, um, so I can't speak to a report. It is, as you well know, common practice uh, for us to do after-action reports on almost everything that we do. So I have f full expectations that uh, as a department, we will take the time to go back and look at this operation, as the secretary said, and, and try to learn lessons from it. Now, whether that's produced in a formal report that makes public, uh, that, that's made public, I, I can't attest to that right now. But we obviously will uh, will go back over the co course of appropriate time and, and try to see uh, what we could have done better uh, and what we can learn from this operation. The other thing, to yesterday, the secretary rightly alluded to the sacrifice of thousands of U.S. contractors who died. I want to ask you, does the DOD have a, a rough order number for how many contractors died? Brown University is widely cited 3,841. Yeah. I've said informal swag, but I wanted to have, does DOD have something? And if not, can you make an attempt to try to get a uh, number? Well, let me take the question, Tony. I don't have a figure here with me today, um, but I'll take the question and see if we have a better answer for you. There's a lot of interest in that subject, and he rightly brought it up yesterday. So it was by no coincidence that he mentioned the sacrifices of our contractors uh, and, the, and the mourning and the suffering that their families are going through, because they were right there on the ground with us almost from the very beginning. Let me take the question and see if we have a better answer. As you might imagine, that might be a little bit more difficult for us to get to because contractors work for companies and, um, uh, and weren't necessarily on the government payroll. The Labor Department has a lot of those stats. The Labor Department has some of those stats. I will take the question, Tony, and see Thank what you. we can do to get you an answer. The Secretary said thousands, too, so he must have some order of magnitude. If, if, if I understand. Could. I'll take the question. Yes, ma'am. So the thank you. So the Secretary Austin and Turkish Defense Minister like had several phone calls about the private, uh, providing security at the Afghanistan. But what's the latest update? I would like to ask. And the second question is: the since airport security provider is still unclear, how those citizens will be able to leave if there is no functioning airport? Like, how uh, um, this one? Um, yeah, no, I got that part. The the first question, the uh, update to what? Like the, I mean, the airport, the Afghanistan. So the what's the update? The the airport security, like who is going to take the Turkish airport, airport security? security. Yeah, um, I think you've heard the State Department talk about this. Uh, there's a, a a number of countries that are in discussions, uh, Qatar and Turkey, or yeah. two of them, for 
being able to provide some measure of airport security so the air, airport can get back up and running. And uh, I understand that they are discussing with themselves how to move forward with the Taliban on that. And I would refer you to those two countries for updates. We would not be a party to that discussion. I got time for a couple more. Orrin? Just a quick question. Do you have a number, uh, an update on the number of Afghans at CENTCOM bases? At CENTCOM bases? I actually think I might. Hold on just a second. I know I had this in here somewhere. You know what, Orrin, I'm not going to hold everybody up. I think I have it in here. Let me keep looking for it, but I, I do think I have it. Okay. I just have to find it. Uh, oh, here we go. I did have it. Uh, in the Central Command AOR, uh, the number is about 16,000. Yeah, thanks, and sorry for the uh, delay there. Just a matter of finding it on the iPad. Yeah, Jim. John, just a... How many American service members all told from the grounds of Afghanistan all the way back to, you know, Fort Bliss and this area were involved in this? Can you give an idea of the, the scope of the involvement of the, of the military in this? Or is there a way to find something like that out? Yeah, let me take the question, Jim. I'm, I'm sure we're talking tens of thousands, yeah. if not more, that were involved in this. Yeah, but... I mean, it had to be... It stretched, it stretched multiple combatant commands area of responsibility. You just heard from UCOM. You're going to hear from uh, General Van Herc tomorrow at NORTHCOM. Of course, we know General McKenzie at, at Central Command. I, I, it, I don't know. It's a great question, and let, let us see if we can go back and, and do the math and get you something more reliable. But I, I have not seen an estimate of total uh, U.S. military personnel involved in this from airlift to evacuation and, and beyond. But uh, I'm sure it's quite sizable. And as you heard the secretary say yesterday, we're, we're proud, in each, proud of each and every one of them. Okay, thanks, everybody. Uh, appreciate it. And um, I think we'll see you tomorrow.